decision. We've got a decision. There you go. The Supreme Court, the decision's in. Six to three, we win, we win. All persons having business before the Honorable, the Supreme Court of the United States are admonished to draw near and give their attention. Landmark Cases, C-SPAN's special history series, produced in partnership with the National Constitution Center, exploring the human stories and constitutional dramas behind 12 historic Supreme Court decisions. Mr. Chief Justice, and may it please the court. Good evening, and welcome to C-SPAN series, Landmark Cases. Tonight's case is New York Times Company versus the United States. In this 1971 case, the Supreme Court ruled six to three against the Nixon administration in a big win for journalism. The decision upheld the New York Times and the Washington Post, which you just saw depicted in this recent movie, right to publish classified information on the story, the history of the Vietnam War over significant objections from the Pentagon and the White House. We have two terrific guests at the table tonight to help us understand how this case unfolded and what it means for us today in our society. Let me introduce you to Floyd Abrams. He might be the nation's best known First Amendment lawyer. Uh, he was co-counsel in the New York Times uh, case and uh, he is now an attorney with Cahill Law Firm in New York City, where he does focus on First Amendment and media law, and also is a guest professor at Columbia University's Journalism School. Welcome to our program. Thank you. Good to be here. We're pleased to welcome back Ted Olson. Uh, Mr. Olson has argued 63 cases in both private practice and for the government before the Supreme Court, including during his term as Solicitor General from 2001 to 2004. Uh, one of his key cases representing President Bush and Bush v. Gore He's uh, also a partner now at Gibson Dunn in, New in Washington, and uh, we are pleased to have you back. You were with us on the first term, and we're glad to have you back for our second season. I'm delighted that you would ask. So we're going to start with understanding how broad or narrow this decision was. Help people understand the decision before we go into all of the details. What did the court actually find? Well, the court found that uh, the uh, Times uh, and, and the Post could not be restrained in advance from publishing a prior restraint, as it's known. Um, and they said that it is a very heavy burden that the government has uh, to overcome. Uh, they have to show real irreparable harm to the country uh, and that the government had failed to do that. So that, that was the ruling of the court. Uh, in addition to that ruling, there were nine separate opinions by members of the court. And while they all agreed that prior restraints are difficult, very difficult to obtain, the vote in the case was six to three, uh, as we just heard, uh, in favor uh, of the times. And uh, the justices ranged considerably in what they said about that from a very modest victory to a very broad one. But at the end of the day, the ruling was that the government, even during a war, even when there were American prisoners of war held by the enemy during that war, uh, had not shown enough uh, that publication of this historical study of how we became involved in Vietnam uh, would do terrible harm. Ted Olson, uh, if it is a narrow decision and prior restraint on the First Amendment, what about this case has made it a landmark decision? Well, this was a very, very big decision. This was the Nixon administration attempting to stop the Washington Post and the New York Times from publishing excerpts of the Pentagon Papers. This was a big, huge study of the origins and the conduct of the Vietnam War. The government was saying it's very important, it's dangerous, to our national security if this material is published and made available to the public. And the Supreme Court of the United States in this six to three decision said, no, we will not stop the publication. If it may have violated the law, 
That's a possibility, and you might want to prosecute people criminally for violating the law if you can prove that, but we will not stop, as Floyd said, uh, in advance, a publication of material that's in the public interest. We won't tell the press under the First Amendment that you can't speak, that you can't publish something. So just to underscore, there's they, they cannot be stopped from publication, but there's no guarantee that there couldn't be sanctions for publication. That's correct. And indeed, uh, opinions of some of the justices who voted for the Times, uh, Justice White and Justice Stewart in particular, indicated that a criminal prosecution could be brought and, and might have succeeded. Uh, I would bear in mind, of course, the case came up very quickly and the members of the court, uh, as some of them complained, uh, were not deeply enmeshed in the facts uh, of the case. Uh, they really left it to the government to persuade them, which the government failed to do, that publication would do great harm. But when you read those opinions, a majority of them thought it would do harm. I think it's worth saying it did not. But a majority of the members of the court thought publication would do harm, and nonetheless, that the Times could, and the Post could publish. This series is about our Constitution. So at the outset, we always look at the constitutional provision that is under examination in the case. This is a First Amendment case, and the First Amendment reads as such, Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof, or abridging the freedom of speech or of the press, or the right of the people peaceably to assemble and to petition the government for a redress of grievances. So a uh, question for both of you. Before this 1971 case, uh, there had been uh, some earlier cases. We have a 1931 Near versus Minnesota, uh, a 64 case, New York Times versus Sullivan. What was the law uh, about how far the press could go in publishing prior to this case? Well, I'd say the most important case was that 1931 case. And uh, in particular, a line in it, which in the course of saying that prior restraints were terribly difficult, almost impossible uh, to be issued by courts, they offered an exception. And the exception was the timing of ships sailing in time of war. So during the case, both sides spent a lot of time arguing about whether this was like a ship sailing in war, or whether publication of this material of how we got into the war in Vietnam was akin to the sailing dates of ships during a war. Uh, so that 1931 case helped enormously and was by far the closest case. And it wasn't that close, but the closest case there was. Ted Olson, the, the Espionage Act of 1917 was the law that the government was looking to uh, in this case. And I'm going to ask uh, uh, what we should know about that law as we think about the questions in the case. Well, the Espionage Act is a very old statute. Uh, it is very unclear as to what it prohibits and under what circumstances it would impose punishment on someone who um, leaked materials, who communicated interest uh, in information in the in the that might do damage to the national security there was an argument in this case uh, about how far it went it did not authorize the government to stop publication of a document it imposed criminal penalties or fines on someone who disclosed national security information uh, the the court specifically pointed out in this case that there was no statute that gave the government the power to ask the courts to stop the publication of materials. This business about prior restraints is very important because if you stop someone from speaking or stop someone from publishing, it won't happen. There's a lot of things that can be done. You can take some risks uh, by speaking something, uh, by speaking about something. That 1931 case was an attempt to stop the publication of defamatory material. It was an expose by the newspaper, and the statute said, well, we can stop, you can stop the publication of defamatory or scurrilous material. And the Supreme Court said, no, you can't do that. The principle is that if you stop someone from speaking, it won't be heard. And that's a very, 
very difficult thing under the First Amendment, which says Congress shall make no law abridging the freedom of the press. You know, there was a time when the only thing that the Supreme Court said was protected by the First Amendment was against prior restraints. Uh, 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 Oliver Wendell Holmes, back in 1905, wrote an opinion saying just that, that, that prior restraints are what the First Amendment is all about and only what the First Amendment is about. Now, we've come a long way since then, but, but the point is really that what, what everyone historically has agreed upon most is that the prior restraints, limitations in advance on speech, are the most dangerous, the most limiting, uh, and therefore the most protected against activity of the government. So uh, 1971, the Vietnam War was beginning uh, to falter for the United States. Uh, there were 156,800 soldiers in Vietnam down from a high of 334,500 just one year earlier. Uh, there are 2,357 U.S. deaths in 1971, down from 6,081 in 1970. And uh, back here on the home front, the war's popularity was certainly diminishing. Uh, we're going to move on to the cast of characters, as we call them in this case, starting with the Pentagon Papers themselves. What were the Pentagon Papers? The Secretary Robert McNamara, the Defense Secretary, had the idea as the war got worse and worse with the fewer and fewer ways out, it seemed, to commission a study, a, a historical study. How did we become involved in the war? What happened? Who did what? Why were we there? One might think you would do that study before you entered a war, but uh, we had not done that. And so Secretary McNamara commissioned that study, got together uh, within the Defense Department uh, scholars and others to use highly classified Defense Department documents to prepare a study of how we became involved, went going back to World War II and thereafter, and all the way to 1968 uh, when the Pentagon Papers ended. Why did the government want to keep the Pentagon Papers secret? Well, it was interesting because it was, it was, this was the Nixon administration that was in charge um, at the time that this litigation was brought. Most of the material in the Pentagon Papers was embarrassing um, and ha harmful to previous administrations uh, because, as Floyd said, this study went back to the Truman administration, back to the, the end of the Second World War, uh, and it was particularly embarrassing to President Johnson. Um, and maybe to a certain degree to President Kennedy. So the Nixon administration wasn't so badly embarrassed by the contents of the material that was indicated that the government had lied to the American people, had done various different things that were quite damaging. Uh, but the Nixon administration became convinced, in part because of uh, Secretary Kissinger, who had made particularly strong arguments, that if you don't stop this, if you don't stop these leaks, where is it going to stop? Uh, and, and you've got to be able to stop this kind of broad-scale leaking of classified, dangerous information, uh, or there's no stopping point. We, and, and we will have no credibility in the rest of the world about our ability to keep secrets if we can't keep this secret. This was 7,000 pages of material. Uh, While well, you mentioned President Nixon, of course, another character in our story tonight, what should people, especially those who weren't alive, know about his relationship with the press uh, as we get into this case? Well, Floyd, of course, knows much more about this than I do, but I think everybody who lived during that period or anyone who's studied it knows that President Nixon was not a fan <laughs> of the press. You could and, say. And vice versa, right? Yeah. So he, he, didn't, he didn't like the press because they'd been critical of him. Um, they'd portrayed him in ways in which he did not like. Um, and he was, he was very concerned about the vulner, his vulnerability to the press. Um, and so this was a hostile, difficult, tortured relationship that he already had with the press. So something like this comes along and he sees that they're publishing secret information and that might be something else next, uh, he's going to react to do whatever he can to stop it. 
I'm going to ask you, uh, Floyd Amos, to, to give people a sense of what the New York Times and the Washington Post, the two petitioners in this case, were like in 1971. Very different media landscape than we're experiencing today. Yes, there were newspapers then, <laughs> and only newspapers and three television networks were the heart of the information givers in the country. Uh, there were local newspapers around the country. Uh, very often, one newspaper in a town or one newspaper in a city, sometimes just a few newspapers in a state. Uh, newspapers were the primary place. Most people got their news. Uh, and as I indicated earlier, three television networks, NBC, CBS, and ABC. Uh, and uh, from those sources, uh, the great bulk of the information came to the public. Uh, and, of course, uh, the world is very different now. This is our first case in this series with Warren Burger as Chief Justice. What should people know about him? <clears throat> well, people should know that, in the first place, this, ca this court that decided this case, there were five of the justices who had been appointed by Republicans. Um, Chief Justice Berger uh, had taken over the Supreme Court, appointed to the Supreme Court by President Nixon, um, and was a very different person than his predecessor, Earl Warren. The Earl Warren Court was quite famous for protecting civil liberties uh, and opening new areas of individual rights and so forth. The Berger Court, Chief Justice Berger, Warren Berger, who had been from Minnesota uh, and, and had served on the, the Court of Appeals for the District of Columbia Circuit, was very interested in the orderly processing of judicial decisions, the structure of the court, how decisions got made, how state courts worked, and that sort of thing. He was a much more businesslike jurist than his predecessor, Earl Warren. Floyd Abrams, there would not be a Pentagon Papers case without Daniel Ellsberg. Who was he? Daniel Ellsberg <clears throat> had been a Marine uh, in the war in Vietnam. Uh, he was an intellectual. Uh, he had favored the war. Uh, in its early days and had come to believe uh, that uh, it was a war crime. He had come to believe that uh, we were doing things in Vietnam which violated international law and principles of morality and the like. Uh, he was one of the authors of the Pentagon Papers. He was a scholar as well as everything else I've said. And so he was one of the authors commissioned to write chapter of the Pentagon Papers. Uh, and uh, he came to the view that if only the public could see the degree to which it had been lied to through the years, uh, which perpetuated American presence uh, in Vietnam, uh, that they would demand that the war end. Uh, uh, he felt notwithstanding our victory and notwithstanding everything else that happened, and he feels today that he failed, that his, mo his motive for releasing this information, for risking jail to himself for a very long time, uh, was uh, to end the war. And uh, the, while the publication was very newsworthy and it affected public opinion, it did not do that. You're listening to C-SPAN's Landmark Cases. We will be back in a moment. Uh, first bit of video, we're going to introduce you to Hedrick Smith. Uh, he was a longtime New York Times reporter and happened to be one of the New York Times reporters that was writing this story. He talked to us very recently, and he told us how the New York Times got the information and how the paper uh, conducted its work to publish that first story. I first saw the papers in the Hilton Hotel on 6th Avenue in New York. Sheehan had gotten a hotel room there up in about the 35th floor. We had two file cabinets that were absolutely full of papers. So we're talking about four drawers, four drawers, eight drawers of papers. I mean, tens of thousands of pages of documents. Uh, and uh, we just started to go through them. Sheehan had just begun looking at them by the time I got there. And it was just amazing to see the amount of material, and to look at one document after another, top secret, top secret, top secret, eyes only, which means you know, only the president can see it, or the secretary of state, or the ambassador, or the commander, or the joint chiefs of staff, whatever. Uh, and we started to go pouring through them, 
to try to figure out how to do stories about him. I mean, there was so much material, it was almost impossible to figure out how to handle it journalistically. What we did was we simply followed the organization of the Pentagon Papers. We took 13 chapters and spread them out and, and basically dealt with them in that way. I think we, in the end we came out with 12 or 13 pay, uh, different days on which we ran the papers. The, the government's argument was that publishing the papers would harm national security. We looked at it. This was history. All these events were over. We're talking about the Eisenhower years, the 1950s, the Kennedy years, the 1960s, and then the Johnson years, the late 1960s, and here we are in 1971. There was only one part of the Pentagon Papers that was live in the sense that events were still unfolding, and that was what was called the diplomatic annex. It was all about the various different efforts and peace channels there were to negotiate some kind of settlement between Washington and Hanoi. We never touched that. We took one look at that. We said, if we write about that, we have no idea whether or not those channels are still alive. We could harm diplomacy. We're not going to go into that. So we were mindful of actual national security needs. And uh, let me show you the headline that came out of that, uh, that uh, work. It was June 13, 1971. Vietnam Archive Pentagon Study Traces Three Decades of Growing U.S. Involvement. Neil Sheehan had the byline uh, for that uh, story. As we said, Chief Justice Warren Berger, and we're going to tell you about the other members of the court, the Nixon appointees were Justice Berger, uh, Chief Berger and Harry Blackman, the Johnson appointees Thurgood Marshall, Kennedy appointees just uh, Bra uh, Byron Wizard White, Eisenhower appointees still on the court in 71, John Marshall Harlan II, William Brennan and Potter Stewart, and uh, Hugo Black and William O. Douglas Roosevelt appointees made up the nine. The case was heard on June 26, 1971, just 13 days after the New York Times published that first article. Uh, there were two hours of oral arguments, and we're going to listen to a little bit. But you didn't argue the case. Tell me about how the legal team was assembled and what the decision was sure. to, on the argument. Well, the chief counsel for the New York Times was Professor Alexandra Bickel from the Yale Law School. <clears throat> uh, Professor Bickel, uh, under whom I studied at law school, was viewed in the language of those days as a conservative academic. Uh, he had clerked for Justice Frankfurter. He was, uh, as he once put it to me, not a First Amendment voluptuary. Uh, uh, and, and he was not. And indeed, if there was any criticism uh, of the Times' lawyers' presentations to the court at every level, uh, made then and even now, uh, it was that we didn't talk enough about the First Amendment. We talked about separation of powers. We talked about statutes. Uh, we talked about a lot of things which we thought might be easier to attract the votes of conservative jurists on the court. We're going to listen to a portion of Alexander Bickel's argument before the Supreme Court. Let me give you a hypothetical case. Let us assume that when the members of the court go back and open up uh, this sealed record, uh, we find uh, something there that absolutely convinces us uh, that its disclosure would result in the sentencing to death of a hundred young men whose only offense had been that they were 19 years old and had low draft numbers. What should we do? Mr. Justice, I wish there were a statute that covered. You're posing me a case, of course, Mr. Justice, in which that element of my attempted definition, which refers to the chain of causation... I suppose in the great the big global picture, this is no... Uh, no, 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 this is not a national threat. There are no, at least 25 Americans killed in Vietnam every week these days. No, sir, but I meant it's a case in which the chain of causation between the act of publication and the feared event, the death of these 100 young men, uh, is obvious, direct, immediate. That's what I'm assuming in my right. hypothetical case. I can only say as to that that it is a case in which, in the absence of a statute, I suppose, most of us would say... Uh, you would say the Constitution requires that it be published and that these men die, no, is that it? No, I'm afraid I have, 
I, I'm afraid that my, the inclinations of humanity uh, overcome uh, the somewhat more abstract devotion to the First Amendment uh, in a case of that sort. So uh, help us understand this hypothetical. What was the justice getting at there? Well, the justice was saying, uh, uh, I want you to assume that as a direct result of publication of the Pentagon Papers, a hundred young men are going to get killed. Right. Are you telling me that the First Amendment requires that we allow that to be published? And now th this was Professor Bickle's first argument anywhere. This was his first case and his first argument in the Supreme Court. The first thing he did was what great advocates like Ted will do sometimes, which is not quite to answer the question, try to bring the justice a little bit away from it. Justice Stewart would have none of that. He insisted on a direct answer to the question, and Professor Bickle gave what he considered, and I considered, uh, the most essential, uh, critical, uh, and needed answer, which was yes, in that situation, a prior restraint would be consistent with the First Amendment. That was a controversial answer. The American Civil Liberties Union the next day filed a brief in the court denouncing that answer, a very rare thing in Supreme Court practice, uh, but it was one that he thought was essential to win over or keep the votes of the two members of the court, Justice Stewart and Justice White, that we thought we needed the most. Here is the uh, ABC News report on June 30th, uh, 1971, when the case was decided. For two and a half weeks, two constitutional principles have clashed. The government's view of our national security versus the newspaper's view of their freedom to print. And the newspapers won. From the Supreme Court where the issue was decided, here is ABC's Bill Zimmerman. A dramatic four minutes late, the justices sat for the business at hand, eight of them with Chief Justice Warren Burger reading the six to three decision in which he was among the dissenters. The opinion quoted from a 1963 case. Any system of prior restraints of expression comes to this court bearing a heavy presumption against its constitutional validity. And here's how those decisions uh, the, turned out. Uh, the six concurrences was a per curiam decision, uh, speaking on the voice of the court, uh, but there were, as Ted Olson said, nine different opinions, really, out of this case. Six concurrences, Justice Black joined by Douglas, Douglas joined by Black, Brennan, Stewart, uh, Stewart's was joined by White, and White joined by Stewart and Marshall, if you can follow all that. <laughs> uh, three dissents, the Chief Justice and uh, Harlan, who were joined by Berger and Blackman and Blackman. Okay, we're going to go through a couple of the very brief uh, texts of the, of the decisions, uh, the opinions. First, the per curiam. Any system of prior restraints of expression comes to this court bearing a heavy presumption against its constitutional validity. The government thus carries a heavy burden of showing justification for the imposition of such a restraint. The district court and the court of appeals held that the government had not met that burden. We agree. Uh, then we had that question about Justice Black and his concurrence. Here's some of what he said. Paramount among the responsibilities of a free press is the duty to prevent any part of the government from deceiving the people and sending them off to distant lands to die of foreign fevers and foreign shot and shell. In my view, far from deserving condemnation for their courageous reporting, the New York Times and the Washington Post and other newspapers should be commended for serving the purpose that the Founding Fathers saw so clearly. So there's our First Amendment absolutist. What do, do you think about this decision, what he's written? I weep with pleasure uh, <laughs> at, at listening at to Justice Black's uh, language. Uh, it was his last opinion on the court. Uh, it was an opinion he was justifiably very proud of, uh, and, and it is one of the uh, uh, enduring uh, remains of uh, New York Times versus United States. I'm going to put two of the dissents on the screen and then ask Ted Olson to react. Uh, Just, Chief Justice Berger, in this case, the imperative of a free and unfettered press comes into collision with another imperative, the effective functioning of a complex modern government, and specifically the ex effective exercise of certain constitutional powers of the executive. Only those who view the First Amendment as absolute in all circumstances, a view I respect but reject, 
can find such a case as this to be simple or easy. And then I'll move on to Justice Harlan. This frenzied train of events took place in the name of the presumption against prior restraints created by the First Amendment. Due regard for the extraordinarily important and difficult questions involved in these litigations should have led the court to shun such a precipitate timetable. I should say that in addition to Justice Black, who was an absolutist, who said that, the, as you read the First Amendment, um, Congress shall make no law abridging the freedom of speech or of the press. He meant no law means no law. Justice Douglas also held that view, and so there were two of those votes. But to get to the dissenting um, voices, you, you heard um, uh, the, the justice say this frenzied pace. One of the other uh, dissenting justices said it was a feverish pace. Uh, what the, the court below that was reversed here had said, let's send it back to the district court for an opportunity to look at the various documents that are threatened here and so that we know what we're doing. So these dissenting justices, in addition to disagreeing somewhat with respect to, um, they agreed that there was a heavy burden with respect to prior restraints, but they, but they also thought that the, we need to know what's going on. In order for us to do our job, we need to know what risk there is, and at least the government should have a, a number of days uh, which is what the Second Circuit had ordered, uh, to look at the documents and make judgments with respect to individual cases. We can't be uh, a, a justices uh, or judges of the damage that could be done here unless we know what we're looking at. Um, and that's not such an unreasonable point of view, except that it clashes with the idea that there shall be no prior restraints, not even a short-term one. Let's listen to how President Nixon and J. Edgar Hoover reacted to the decision. <laughs> Edgar, yeah. I wanted to tell you that I was so damn mad when that Supreme Court had to come down. I did, first, I didn't like their decision, but I didn't either. unbelievable, wasn't it? It was unbelievable. You know, those clowns we've got on there, I, I'll tell you, I hope I outlive the bastards. Well, I hope yeah. you do, too. But I mean, politically, too, because by, we've got to change that court. I, there's no question yeah. about that whatsoever. Yeah. I thought it was a possibility of a five to four. Yeah. You know, I thought I thought we ought to get white. What's the matter with him? I don't. Well, of course, Wizard White is a yeah. old Kennedy yeah. crowd. Right. So. But then the other one know what in the hell is the matter with Stewart? Well, Stewart is a, is a very wishy-washy individual. He switches from one side to yeah. the other. Isn't that priceless, being able to hear a president's it thoughts? Is. Yeah. It is. So, uh, your reaction, both of you. Well, I will say that, that, that um, it's very predictable listening to various different tapes of Richard Nixon, but if you listen to tapes from Lyndon Johnson and some of the language in his comments about things that were going on, and probably other presidents have felt the same way every time they lose a decision in the Supreme Court. It, I don't know whether they use the same language, but I suspect that you would hear, if there were more tapes, similar language from other presidents who are disappointed. You've covered some very, very interesting, and are covering some very interesting cases in, these, in this series, um, and presidents don't like to lose anything particularly in the Supreme Court, when they pretty much know that is the end of the line. So what happened to Daniel Ellsberg, the leaker? Um, he went back to his real life. Uh, uh, he taught. Uh, uh, he wrote. He was never prosecuted. He, w he was prosecuted for a time, and, and uh, nothing came of it. I mean, the, the, the prosecution which was brought about the Pentagon Papers was uh, aborted by the fact of the break-in that, that Ted referred to, which was uh, the break-in commissioned by the President of the United States, which led the judge, Judge Byrne in California, uh, to say this is conduct of such uh, enormous uh, uh, unacceptability uh, so destructive of the judicial system that this trial can't continue. So in any event, Ellsberg never went to jail, but he, he should get credit, a lot of credit, for being willing to do something as dangerous to his own 
safety uh, uh, as this. I'm going to ask each of you to kind of put a wrapper on this for our audience. In the context of the complex media environment in which we live today, uh, what is the meaning of the Pentagon Papers case? What's the import of it for our society? You want to start, Tuttle? Well, I think that it will always remain uh, a precedent of the United States Supreme Court that the First Amendment, the one thing that the First Amendment protects is the ability to speak or to publish, except in extreme circumstances. There are ways in which uh, speech and the press can be constrained with respect to libel or with respect to copyright or with respect to various different things. But generally speaking, telling someone that they can't speak, censoring speech, uh, is something that the, the courts are going to look at with great skepticism. I, I agree with all of that. I'd simply add that I think that the, the lesson, the impact of the case on American presidents has been to persuade them, their advisors and the like, that when somebody wants to print something, the president can't stop it. The presidents aren't going to go to court. Presidents don't go to court. Even when presidents feel strongly that information should not be published, that doesn't mean that you can't have such a case. But it says something, that the only case since 1971, when the Pentagon Papers was decided, was about the H-bomb, no less, and we haven't had one since. So that's almost a non-weapon now of the presidency uh, because of the Pentagon Papers case. Well, how, because you worked inside uh, two administrations, what are your thoughts on this restraint on the presidency? Well, I think that... For <laughs> Presidents are always frustrated with what the press does and what the press says and what the press doesn't say. And presidents always feel, and I work with um, President George W. Bush in the administration at the time of 9-11, uh, and he and his people around him were determined, we must not let that happen again. Um, and that th those kind of policies may have led to certain decisions that some people feel were wrong, but presidents will be motivated by their need, their perceived need, to protect the citizens of the United States from violence, terrorism, um, and the, to protect the security uh, and independence of, 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 of all of our citizens. As we close, a thanks to our partners at the National Constitution Center for their help in, in producing this series. Thank you, Floyd Abrams. Thank you, Ted Olson, for giving our audience the benefit of this really interesting discussion tonight on the press freedom and the First Amendment. We appreciate you Thank being you. here. Thank Thanks. you. Thanks for you being in the audience tonight, and we'll see you for our next landmark case.